Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Lights and Perfection. You are here for this segment of Moment in the Word and my name is Chris. For this segment, what we try to do is bring to you, our brothers and sisters, the truth about biblical perfection and holiness to light through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we do that by breaking into God's Word and pulling out of it spiritual biblical principles that we can apply to our daily lives so that we might deepen, enrich, and enliven our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to cause us to become doers of His Word and not just hearers only. Let's get started. Greetings and welcome back, everyone, again for this segment of Moment in the Word. Again, my name is Chris. I haven't done these specific sets of videos. As you'll notice, I focused more on real gospel for real people. It's the same YouTube channel, just different segments that are geared towards different groups and different targets, whereas Moment in the Word is more about a little bit deeper of a study of the scriptures, whereas real gospel for real people is just sometimes just raw testimony and using scripture and just talking about very real things. Uh, for the benefit of new believers as well as people that have been believers for a while, whereas this is primarily just for people that are believers so that they can get a deeper theological grasp on what we are called to be as Christians. And in today's segment of Moment in the Word, this is something that God has stirred up in my heart as of recently, and the context here is finding favor. Now you may say, yes, but Brother Chris, we have favor through Jesus Christ. And I will say, yes, absolutely, 100%. Um, we do. We have favor with God through what Jesus Christ alone did. It's by grace through faith. We don't have to earn it. It is the gift of God. But there is something to be said about needing more of God in our lives. To think that we've ever reached the limit just because Jesus hung his head and said, it is finished, that we don't no longer need to grow in our relationship with him, we would be ignorant and unwise and unstable in our understanding of the scriptures. And so for this segment, it's finding favor after the favor, so to speak. One key example is from Exodus 33 verses 12 through 16. And this is about Moses and God's command to him to bring his people to the promised land. And so Moses kind of questions God and he's having this interaction with him. But there's some key significant areas that I really want to focus on in terms of finding favor, even after the fact of finding favor with God. And Moses says it best here, starting at verse 12. Let's go ahead and jump in. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that, a, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Hallelujah. So here we have, if I have found favor in your sight, which you're telling me you've found favor, I've found favor in your sight. Now, if I've found favor and that is true, what you're telling me, then show me your ways in order that I may find favor in your sight. And so what does that mean? It seems like a contradiction, but it's not. It's, it's something that I think Proverbs 25, 2 best describes. And I want to go ahead and click over to that real quick. It's just a real quick scripture. And Let's see here. We'll do my favorite here, you know, the English Standard Version. So, It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search things out. Let's repeat that. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. Now, it is important that we understand that no matter where we are in our walk with Christ— there is always a need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Just because Jesus did say it is finished 
it was true. It's a hundred percent. It is finished, but it does not mean that the, the covering of grace and mercy will just cover every action and inaction that we have. Notice how I said action and inaction. Yes, that is true. Even our inactivity could be found as sin just as much as our active sin. And so apathy is lukewarmness of which Jesus himself spoke of to the, the lukewarm church in the one of the letters to the churches in Revelation. He said, you know, I wish that you were cold or hot, then I'd know what to do with you. But since you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of what makes a lukewarm Christian. The Holy Spirit can convict each one of us in different areas at different times in our lives to prove when and how we have been apathetic or complacent in our walk. But something that is needed in our lives is, as it is the glory of God to conceal things, it's the glory of kings to search things out. Now, we may not be kings, but we are children of God. We are a kingdom of priests, and it is our duty to seek and press in to know the God of heaven more and more and more every day. The people that do this are going to find their testimony is going to grow. It's going to bear fruit. They're going to always have an experience, an encounter with God. And it doesn't mean that every day they're going to be like, oh, thus says the Lord, the Lord told me this, or I had this vision or this or that. I'm not talking necessarily just about those things, but sometimes just the intimate involvement of God in your life on a daily basis. Not just where I can say, well, since I woke up, I can thank God, but to actively be able to see God at work in your life because you are pressing in to know him more and more to find that favor, that sweet spot with God. You know, there is sometimes that I go through seasons of, of, of serious dryness, and it's in those that I try to find a, a, a spiritual well to dig, so to speak. And so I can find that favor with God. Again, I look at Moses in saying, you know, you, you say that I found favor in your sight, but if that's true, and I have found favor in your sight, then show me your ways. Show me how to do this. Show me how to bring your people to the promised land because it doesn't seem like they want to go and it doesn't seem like things are working out in our favor even though you say I found favor in your sight. So why don't you show me your ways so I can continue to find favor in your sight so I can seek what you have concealed so I can try to seek, ask, and knock. And that's what's so beautiful about what Jesus said. Keep asking, seeking, and knocking. This is an active disciple of Jesus Christ pressing in to know more clearly the ways of God and how God can challenge us in our lives to grow closer to him. There was an illustration. I don't even think I have it up here anymore. No, I don't. I deleted it off, but it was uh, something that I'll bring in at a later teaching. But um, I was working on an illustration of a hot air balloon with chains that are chained to the earth. And then there was, in this illustration, there was hands reaching out from heaven, um, right underneath the sun, reaching out saying, you know, come to me. And the hot air balloon kept trying to rise up and rise up, but it was chained to the ground. And so some of those chains had to be broken. And in this illustration, in pressing on to know and to find favor with God, I've noticed that his pattern and process, the principle, if you will, laid out through scripture is that God has certain things concealed. And as he begins to reveal them, whether it's the outward plan for our life or inward work of Christ through sanctification of the Holy Spirit, there is a plan and purpose and God is involved and active in breaking those chains so that we can be less attached to the things of this world and more attached to his purpose and plan for our lives. There are so many things that God does in my life that I could perceive as, oh no, God must be mad at me because he's allowing me to go through this difficulty. And that's not necessarily the case. It's sometimes in those difficulties that we're able to seek and to press in to know the Lord God and find favor in his sight, even though we already found favor in his sight through Jesus Christ. There's another key situation, but I want to keep going into the why the need for this teaching. And it may not be for everyone, but it's something God is stirring up on my heart. And he often does that through circumstances. And so I've been trying to minister God's word for quite some time. And to be very transparent and honest, it's not always easy because people don't always have ears to hear and they maybe just are at a different place in their walk and, and just don't have... a uh, 
the ability to understand or comprehend. I don't know, but there's some things that God will lay on my heart to share. And when those things are rejected, I start to question and I press on to seek to answer for answers from God. And Daniel's a person just like that. And I'm not trying to equate myself to Daniel by any means, but I'm saying that there's a pattern here of people of God seeking to find the favor of God, seeking for answers, to keep asking, seeking, and knocking. And in that, that develops their life in Christ, and they begin to find more favor with God because they seek to be closer to him. You know, it's like you have a you have a, a, a grandparent, uh, and you have, let's say, the, the grandparent has two grandkids, and the grandkids come over to grandpa's house, right? And everybody loves going to grandma and grandpa's house. And so, He's over at grandpa's house and, and you got one kid that just wants to go outside and play by himself in the yard. And then you got one that just wants to come and hang out with grandpa. Now, when grandpa has his snack time and he he pulls out some goodies and, and all that stuff, who's going to get him? Is it the kid that's out running away, you know, running away, hanging out, doing his own thing? Or is it the one that's wanting to sit next to grandpa? And it's kind of the same thing with God. You know, God has an abundance of blessings for all of his children. And unfortunately, not all of his children are going to get to experience and, and encounter him in the same way because sometimes people have grown apathetic and complacent in their walk with God and think they have it all figured out already or misdefined things or whatever it is. And so it's the person that presses on to find favor with God that ends up finding a deeper, more meaningful relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see it even in Jesus' own walk how there were some disciples that were called to be closer. And others were given opportunities to exercise their faith, but not all of them did in the exact same pattern. And so you could see like there was some disciples that were just closer and other ones that were kind of trailing along. And I don't want to be one that trails along. I don't know about you, but I want to press on to know the Lord. And so when I read, it's the glory of God to hide, but the glory of kings to seek and find. It's a beautiful illustration. And just like Moses as well, if I have found favor in your sight, like you say I found favor, well then show me your ways. Show me how to draw closer to you. Show me how to have a closer, more intimate walk with you. And so for me, I had touched on, you know, sometimes it's hard, it's difficult for me just being transparent when God stirs you up to share a message that will draw someone else closer to him and they can't hear it or understand it or they reject it because they hear it a certain way and they usually hear it in the way that they were brought up or indoctrinated in their church circles. And so they will hear, well, I feel like I'm being corrected right now when God is a God of love and he does bring correction in our lives. But much like that hot air balloon, it's to bring us to a deeper place in him. And so my view, and I was sharing this with my wife, we were talking about it because when we were younger and we were, let's say we were uh, disciplined for doing something wrong, we felt like a complete failure and we were just never going to make it. We were like, woe is me. I'm such a failure. I feel so ashamed. I'm never going to make it. But we failed to look at the person disciplining us as someone who loved and cared deeply for us. And so I'm not saying my wife had the same thing. I'm saying like, this is what I was sharing about my part and she was sharing her own things. But for me, when I was a kid growing up, I, I came from, you know, broken home, went through a lot of stuff in my childhood. And later on, when I started to get really sour in life, People would come in and try to, and you know, you know, family members say, "Oh, well, you know, you should look at it like this." And I'm like, "You know what? Get away from me! I don't want to look at it like that." And and I felt more like uh, offended that they had the audacity to correct me. Now, of course, today I see that differently. And so, what I'm trying to say is that this is an earthly illustration of the God of Heaven when He calls things out in our life individually one-on-one -on -one through direct revelation, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, or he brings a brother or sister along that is truly speaking according to the word of God and through his, the leading of his spirit to just minister biblical truth. And when a person has that view of, well, I just feel like I'm being corrected, then this isn't gracious. This isn't merciful. This isn't loving. And so I can't accept that. But it is gracious and merciful and loving because God himself says it is. And so his word brings correction. It breaks into pieces so that it can mend us back up. It is a double-edged sword. And so I will never minister anything that I haven't had to go through ministry in. And so that's an important aspect of ministry as well, is, is to walk what you teach, walk what you preach. And so I can only share messages 
that God has performed in my life. Um, and people may differ, differ with me on that. That's okay. That's their, their prerogative ministry, not, not nothing wrong with it and nothing necessarily, um, overall like the be all end all with with my approach but this is how god uses me and this is how i view scripture and this is how i see him active in other believers lives as well throughout the scriptures and so i want that in my life i want to be able to uh reverberate if you will second corinthians when paul said blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ the father of mercies and god of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any need but the problem is today we think of comfort as in somebody just coming alongside of us and patting us on the back and being there, there now or providing a, a natural need. And while those things are good and, and excellent, there's something deeper about the life of Christ in us. And he uses different gifts and different people to pull that out of us. In fact, the whole point of gathering together, you know, you hear people say the scripture, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. The whole point of that gathering is actually to stir one another up to love and good works. And sometimes that comes through corrective measures. But a lot of people, if they view that as, oh no, woe is me, I'm, I've, this person's making me feel offended because they're making me feel like I'm not doing things right. And while this is the, the principle behind their thinking is that, well, I found favor with God through Jesus Christ and what he did, so I don't need anything else. And so anything else is just you know, legalism or the law, but it's not. It's God stirs us up through each other, through the different various giftings of the Spirit. And if we reject those types of gifts in our church, then all we're actually doing is heaping up teachers for ourselves because we have itching ears. I find that people are more receptive to a message that tells them how good they are rather than a message that says, hey, this is what God's trying to do in your life. And it's, it's really weird to me because, you know, I, like I said, I admit I was like that too early on in my Christian walk, but then I discerned, I, I started to discern through reading the scriptures and prayer that God isn't unloving when he brings that correction about in our lives through each other or directly to us. It's actually to break one of those chains off of our balloon so he can draw us closer to him. And, but if I have this view of God as, um, you know, what I just shared, well, then I'm going to reject those types of messages. But, you know, Hebrews 12 talks about, you know, no discipline is pleasant for the moment, but yet it bears the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so what I'd rather focus on is the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, rather than, oh, this is just painful. I don't like it. Woe is me. What I want to do is flip the script and say, wow, this is who God is. This is his character. And be like a Berean, and when people share things, if it's truly discerned to be led by the Spirit and not just, you know, worldly concern, then I can discern that and take that to God and say, hey, God, what's in this? You know, there's been many times that I've been corrected and I discerned that it was through the Holy Spirit, and I said, wow, you know what? They're right. And sometimes it even came through an unbeliever, and, and not saying that God was speaking through them by the Holy Spirit, but sometimes God will use situations to poke and prod at us to get us to see things that we normally wouldn't see. And then our job as a believer is to be humble and say, wow, you know, there might be something to this. Let me go to God in prayer. And so every day, it's about going to God in prayer and finding favor with him, even though we already have it. Now, I hope that made sense. I know I was going into detail on that, and I, there was a, a point to it, and I hope that I was able to bring up those, those different aspects and, and illustrations and principles so that we can get a fuller understanding of what it really means to press in to know God. Now, I do want to jump into a quick disclaimer because even this is stirred on by the Lord. And so I have taught in other teachings the scripture in Philippians, I believe, too, where it says, For it is God who is at work within you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And that's in the same similar context of, you know, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So it is important that even though we find favor with God, that is his grace and mercy that actually calls us deeper to him. And so it's grace. Um, and Paul made the best illustration. It was actually Jesus making the illustration to Paul in when he had the thorn in his flesh. And I'm not going to jump to that scripture because I have some other ones pulled up. Well, maybe I should, actually. So let me go ahead and pull it up then. All right. So this here is Paul speaking. 
and he said, so to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. So here's a beautiful illustration of, of the, the true grace of, of God. It's not just to cover, it's to empower, right? And so here he says Jesus' response. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Look at that play on words right there that Jesus himself did. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, Paul concludes and he says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's an object of humility when we're able to say, hmm, God, you know what? I don't like what I'm going through and yet your grace is sufficient because your power is perfected in weakness. And that applied to his, we believe, maybe it, it was a physical ailment, maybe it was a spiritual ailment. We don't know what the thorn was for Paul, but we can derive b biblical principle and spiritual truth from that to apply to our daily lives. And so God's grace is more than enough and it's empowering us to become more like Jesus and to draw closer to God. And so it is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Another passage of scripture I wanted to talk on was Daniel. And so the reason why I want to highlight Daniel is because we know Daniel was a man of God, but yet Daniel had this amazing um, thing that we're about to read here where he started to understand something and said, you know what? There's more to this. I need to really, really plea for mercy with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. In the illustration here, it's similar to, to Exodus 33. You know, here's, here's Moses saying, you know, I found favor in your sight, but if that's true, show me your ways. Show me how to find more favor, favor in your sight. Now, here's a little bit different of a scenario. Daniel was one of the captives from Babylon, or from the Babylonian captivity, rather, from Jerusalem. He was taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. He sat under many kings under Babylon and even uh, Persia. Um, and so the idea here is starting in verse 1 says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the numbers of years, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, that must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. I'm going to stop right there real quick. So here is Daniel starting to understand what Jeremiah was prophesying before the fall of Jerusalem and how God had ordained judgment to come to the nation and there was a cap of time that had to take place and that was 70 years. And so that 70 years of captivity had to happen before any of the other promises would be fulfilled. Like, how about Jeremiah 29, 11? I know the plans I have for you, plans for peace and not for evil. That was in context of the finishing of the 70 years of captivity for God's people before they were allowed to be allowed to return back to their land. And so here's Daniel, and he is perceiving, understanding from the prophet Jeremiah. And so because of that, in verse 3, right after what I just read, he said, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And so he started to make confession and, and calling God on his covenant. Why? Because he started seeking these things out. And in that seeking of those things out, he was drawing closer to God. God used Daniel in a mighty way. And it doesn't mean that we have to be used in this huge, extravagant way that's going to be historical and, and compound into the future where people are going to be able to look back and be like, oh, look at that guy. That's Daniel right there. We may not have that. We may be, you know, called to just observe and worship God in silence and just minister to people on the low key. And that's okay. But it's about having a profound relationship with God, truly knowing him as Paul said, in the power of his resurrection. Amen. So here we have the whole point of this teaching is finding favor. 
We have Moses, we have Daniel, we have Paul. We have all these illustrations. I gave you illustrations of why some people might reject that call to the deeper life. It's important that we don't because in that, what we're actually doing is not rejecting you know, what, what we just dislike. We're actually beginning to reject what God loves. And that could be a dangerous thing. God wants all of his children to flourish and prosper. And I don't just mean, you know, financial stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the inner life of Christ in them. There's amazing books that I used to study um, in my time in prison, just tons of them going through situations like this of there was so many different illustrations throughout scripture that I could have gone into. But this this idea of really pressing into know God and how important it is and integral in our lives. And when you spend time in his presence, it changes you from the inside out. You know, some are going to bear 30 fold, some 60 fold, some 100 fold producers of fruit. But the truth is, everybody who seeks God should be bearing fruit. And if you think the lowest number in that equation was 30 fold, you realize that's a 30 X. I don't know if you understand investing at all, but if you're able to 2X your investment, you've done really good. So can you imagine a 30X investment? That's unheard of, that's unparalleled. Most people, it's not just a 30% increase, it's 30 fold. And so it is, it is 30 times. And so that's really important to note that we wanna have the faith that yearns for more and then that faith that yearns for more also produces more. Why? Because we are abiding in Christ. And so it's all about abiding in Christ. But sometimes we need to, as here's another beautiful illustration, Abraham, when he was called to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, right? Just an amazing story. Just a beautiful story and an illustration of, of the deeper life of, of God's people. You know, here he is, he's got his servants, he's got his son, they've got the wood, they've got the knife, they got the, the, the flintstone, you know, all these different things so that they can accomplish this task. But he goes way up there and then there's a point though that's really fascinating and he stops his servants and says, you guys wait here, we need to go further to worship. Sometimes it is necessary to go further to worship. I mentioned sometimes in those dry seasons where we have to literally dig wells. You know, it's, it's amazing that there's different seasons in our life. But the point is, is that no matter what season, we should be ready in or out of it to bear fruit to God. We should be like the tree planted by streams of water that bears fruit in its season and its leaves do not wither in off season. And so it's important that we're always striving to find favor with God, regardless of where we're at in our walk. It's all grace and love and mercy, but it's also discipleship and truth mixed in with it. These things aren't separate. You know, when I read the story of the gifts of the Spirit and then the love of the Spirit, I see so many different teachers that kind of like separate the two. It's kind of like you can't separate God, right? So when you are truly operating in submission to the leading of the Holy Spirit, you're going to be operating in love. But sometimes that love is misdefined by the world around us because God's love chastises us and corrects us. God's love provides for us and cares for us and comforts us. It's not to offend us. It's not to burden us. It's to bring us to a deeper, more richer life in him. And that's the beauty of what God can do in our lives. Well, Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm going to hop off here in a second. I, I this Again, I thank you for tuning in. Before I go, I'll have a little prayer over each and every one of you. Again, thank you for tuning in. But if you can, hit the like, hit the subscribe, get the viewer count up so that we can spread the message of God all over and give everybody an opportunity to hear. It's important. If you have concerns, questions, legitimate concerns or questions or prayer requests, and you want to drop them in the comments, that's fine. We respond to those things. Um, if you're sincerely seeking for, for answers or a prayer, and if you don't feel comfortable doing that, we invite you to hit any of our social media links that are in the description below and maybe just reach out there or through the website, through the contact page. You can try any of those areas if you really need prayer or have sincere questions because we are here for you. That's what it's all about. It's not about us just getting in front of a camera to speak things. Like it's never about us. It's always about you and glorifying God above all things. Well, before we go, we will say this quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to 
read your word, to understand your word, to interpret your word through the leading of your spirit. I pray for everyone watching, Lord, that you would bless them and keep them, that you would make your face to shine upon them, that you would be gracious unto them. Lift your countenance upon them and give them peace. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We love you.